Everybody hear me okay? Great. So thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's a huge honor to be sort of on stage with some of the great minds and, and great ideas that, uh, that I've been hearing about uh, throughout the day, but also in the green room backstage. Um, and I'm like a kid in a candy store in these types of events because there's so much passion, there's so many great ideas, uh, it's very inspiring and motivating. And so what I want to talk to you today is about influence in social networks and specifically in social media networks. And this topic has been getting a lot of attention recently uh, through lots of different avenues and channels. I'm sure you guys are aware of clout and, and the fact that Facebook is going to IPO in the spring at $100 billion. And, uh, and so what I do is I sort of study these big social networks and I try to understand how people influence each other and what that means for society as well as for business. And as you can imagine, this has a lot to do with social commerce. I teach in a business school, so uh, this is a, a cover from a UK Wired magazine which says, uh, how your networks are driving what you buy, right? And driving what you buy is about peers influencing one another to buy certain products or be interested in certain things. Um, cloud is a good example of this. Like in my lab, we detected a statistically significant spike in depression when they changed their algorithm and everybody's score sort of like depressed. And you saw on Twitter everybody complaining about, you know, well, why is my score going down? And, and what does this really mean for me? And, you know, is my influence score going to determine my future, you know, ability to get a job and my, my pay and things like that? It's not just about commerce, though. So there's a lot of debate about whether Facebook and Twitter and other types of information technologies helped influence the Arab Spring, helped spread movements like Occupy Wall Street. And so this is about individuals and social networks enabled by information technology sharing information and influencing one another to do things like mobilize for political protest, right? And so when I was thinking about, well, how can I sort of anchor this discussion on somebody or, you know, this well-known and sort of understands what this topic is all about, I thought to myself, what should I talk about? Who should I talk about? And I came up with this guy, uh, Ashton Kutcher. Um, and I thought to myself, yeah, Ashton Kutcher is like the poster boy for influence in social media networks, right? A plus K. Everybody knows Ashton Kutcher. So I searched the internet for, it, for an image of Ashton Kutcher, and I found this image. And when I found this image, I realized that he's actually the poster boy for influence uh, in social media networks, because this was a poster which says influence and has his huge picture on it. And underneath it says, behind every great man is 3,953,895 followers, which I'm sure is out of date, OK? So with a show of hands, can you please raise your hand if you know who Ashton Kutcher is? OK. I won't ask you if you're following him on Twitter. That's pretty much everybody in this room. Now raise your hand if you've ever done anything that Ashton Kutcher has told you to do. So it sort of begs the question, right? What is influence? What does it mean to influence someone? And is it right to count up my followers to figure out what my influence is, right? And so I proposed a different definition in an article I published in Marketing Science, and that is, Social influence is how the behaviors of one's peers change the likelihood or the extent to which one engages in a behavior. So it's not about how many followers you have, but it's really about behavior change, doing something you would not have done because of someone's interaction with someone or influence over you. And it's about how behaviors spread in a population. And I study this because I believe that if we can understand how behaviors spread in a social network and thus in a population, from person to person to person to person, then we can potentially promote behaviors like these, condom use or tolerance. And we could potentially contain behaviors like these, smoking, dirty needle sharing. And the idea is uh, I mine massive social network data to understand how individuals influence one another to do everything for, from buy a different product vote for a different political candidate, or adopt a new health behavior like exercise or eating right. And I study incentive systems to promote and contain behaviors based on these methods. Okay. So the key to all of this research is causal inference. 
causal statistical estimation. So I have this cartoon on my office door. It's the only cartoon on my office door. And it's two friends talking, and one says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the friend says, it sounds like the class helped. And the guy goes, well, maybe. <laughs> and the idea is that maybe this guy has a proclivity to understand statistics, has an interest in statistics, and therefore selects into the statistics class. And the statistics class isn't teaching him as much about this difference as you would expect the class to teach him, because he's selecting into the class. And there could be all sorts of other explanations as well. In network science, this is known as the reflection problem. So human behaviors tend to cluster in social networks space and in time. We know this. There's abundant evidence on this now. Uh, people who are connected in a social network tend to do the same things, tend to like the same things, and tend to do the same things at approximately the same time. But is this because of peer influence or alternative explanations? And this is sort of what I spend all of my waking hours trying to answer in different types of contexts. So let me give you an example. In 2007, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler published this really good study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and what this study showed was that body mass index increases are correlated over time amongst friends. And the collective unconscious and the news media picked this result up and got news stories like this one, front page of the New York Times magazine, that says, are your friends making you fat? That's a pretty causal statement, right? But the idea is that there could be alternative explanations for this result besides a causal relationship between your friend getting fat and you getting fat. For instance, homophily. And what homophily means is simply birds of a feather flock together. We tend to make friends with people who are like ourselves, and this could also explain pockets of obesity and pockets of less obesity in a social network. So maybe marathon runners tend to be friends, and people who like the all-you-can-eat buffet line at Denny's tend to be friends, and so you get pockets of obesity and pockets of non-obesity in the social network, right? Um, and this is a long, you know, long-standing theory about human social networks. So this quote, birds of a feather flock together, was originally attributed to Robert Burton in the 1500s, but it's even older than that, because before Robert Burton, it was Aristotle who was saying people love those who are like themselves, and before Aristotle, it was Plato who said similarity begets friendship. And just to prove to you that a long line of very esteemed, worthy scholars have made this argument, it was my mom who said, hanging out with a bad crowd will get you into trouble. <laughs> she was none too pleased when I quipped at the dinner table that she might have gotten the causal structure of that sentence wrong. So, uh, Slate ran an article, which ironically is called Everything is Contagious, which was ironically about the contagion amongst academics to publish studies about contagion. And so it's not just obesity is contagious, but apparently happiness is contagious, and product adoption is contagious, and cooperation is contagious, and my favorite one, loneliness is contagious, <laughs> which I'm not exactly sure how the causal social mechanism works there. Um, and it's not just the reflection problem and homophily, there could be confounding factors. So for instance, people who work together might be more likely to be friends and your work might offer you an incentive to go to the gym, pay you a bonus if you are healthy. Uh, or you might live in the same neighborhood as the people you tend to be friends with and a new restaurant may open up in your local neighborhood. So they might be geographic reasons for these correlations. So separating causal influence from all of these other factors is important for two reasons. The first is that the causal structure of the underlying dynamic process uh, of the spread of a behavior through, the through a network implies different diffusion properties for the behavior. Where is it going to go next? So who should we target? And different optimal containment and promotion policies. How can we speed this behavior up or slow it down? And so we did a study with Yahoo, uh, and we looked at uh, a social graph of 30 million individuals interacting over instant messenger over six months. And we also studied these same people's adoption of a new product that they launched. And we were trying to understand how we could separate peer influence from correlated preferences in the consumer population. Um, and we devised a new statistical technique, which we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's called dynamic match sample estimation. It essentially takes match sample estimation and puts it in a dynamic network context, okay? And what we found in this study was that 
Uh, if you don't appropriately control for homophily and other confounding factors, you would overestimate influence by about 700% in this network. And that 50% of the adoptions that you thought were due to peer influence were really just observable homophily, correlated preferences or other confounding factors. And I tell this result to my friends, and, and I'm like, oh my god, can you believe this, 700%? And they're like, wow, Sinan, you are a huge nerd. Like, why does that matter? Why do we care about this at all? And I tell them that the reason that matters is because if you are trying to adopt a policy that would either promote or, uh, or contain a behavior like this, it completely matters. And let me give you an example. So let's say I gave you a data set, and it was a consumer population that was linked. And I said, look, there's a huge correlation amongst friends adopting this behavior. And in scenario A, I told you that 90% of this correlation was because of peer influence and only 10% was because of homophily. And in scenario B, I told you 90% was because of homophily and only 10% was because of peer influence. In the first scenario, you'd want to adopt a peer-to-peer -peer referral marketing strategy where you incentivize people to get their friends to adopt the product because peer influence seems to be at play in consumers' decisions to adopt this product. In the second scenario, you would want to just adopt a traditional demographic sort of segmentation strategy because it's the individual's characteristics which themselves are correlated with their peers that are driving the adoption of the behavior. So if the NIH is trying to figure out how to stop obesity in this country, then figuring out this correlation is directly related to whether the $2 billion they spend on that problem is going to be effective whether they should adopt a peer-to-peer -peer strategy or some other strategy. So uh, in this study, we found uh, this was the sort of influence or the probability of adoption given that your friend or friends adopt uh, if you aren't controlling for confounding factors. And this is influence once you control for correlated preferences. So you're 16 times more likely, or it would seem, but you're actually really only three times more likely due to peer influence to adopt the behavior, okay? Now, the other thing about this graph that's interesting is that this is the life cycle of the product. Here's the product's launch, and then it sort of continues out. We observed it for uh, even longer than this, but at this point it was sort of getting to be uh, understood what was going on. But here, if a marketer looked at this, they would say, wow, there's lots of peer influence at the beginning of the product's life cycle when it's launched and then not much afterwards, right? So that would say, okay, let's adopt a peer-to-peer -peer strategy in the beginning and not in the end. But when you do the, the match sample estimation, you see that peer influence is relatively constant throughout the entire process. And why is this the case? Why does homophily look so much more like peer influence in the beginning rather than in the end? And it's because uh, people are more different uh, from their non-adopter friends if they're an early adopter. So the people who adopt the product early, the non-laggards, the leaders who adopt innovations right away, are a lot different than their non-adopter friends, than people who adopt the iPhone you know, a year after it comes out. They look a lot more like their non-adopter friends. So these people who are waiting in line at the Apple store are much more different than their friends who haven't adopted the iPhone than somebody who doesn't wait in line at the Apple store but buys an iPhone two years down the road. Okay? So that study was interesting, but it had a couple of limitations. It was about a product that existed, so we just tried to study ex post whether there was influence in the process. And uh, it was, uh, there was um, nothing about the design of the product that uh, we could control. So we wanted to ask a more sort of uh, advanced question. Not only can we design a product to make it go viral, but let's do an experiment, because experiments are really the gold standard of causal inference. Um, so what we did was we did an experiment uh, on Facebook amongst about 2 million people. And we created a product, a commercial product, and we created different versions of it with uh, certain viral features turned on and off. And then we observed the diffusion of the product through the network and saw, well, how much did turning on this viral feature contribute to the diffusion of the product? 
So we looked at two features, personal invitations and passive awareness. Personal invitations, you can imagine if I said to you, okay, I'll give you the ability to invite your friends to TEDx Columbia Engineering next year. And passive awareness, I said, you know what, I'll give you all a t-shirt. And so any of your friends that see you wearing the t-shirt will be made aware of the fact that you went and what it is and, and et cetera, okay? And what we found was that, as you might expect, the personal invitations were much more effective per message. So about three times effective, as effective at getting someone to adopt the product uh, than passive awareness. And yes, personal invitations, turning on personal invitations, nearly doubled the diffusion of the product in the network, which is a huge result. Um, but even though they're more effective per message and they double the contagion, the passive awareness campaign uh, nearly tripled the diffusion in the population because even though each was less effective per message, there were many more of these seen overall, okay? So we also wanted to look at, well, what happens to the engagement with the product? Do they stick with the product or do they just adopt it and churn? And what we found was that personal invitations were associated with an increased engagement and less likelihood to churn. Uh, but passive awareness wasn't. And the reason is because when I invite someone specific to join me in a product, that creates a network externality where the value of the product is greater to me. So think if I was on Netflix and I invite you to come to join me on Netflix and I see your recommendations for movies and they help me pick movies on a Friday night, then I get more value from the product from the people that I've invited and I care about what movies, uh, their movies opinion, right? But if it's just a random person in my social network, I care a lot less whether they're using the product or not, and so having them join me on the network doesn't drive engagement as much. And what this means is that there's a virtuous cycle between peer adoption and engagement, right? Because if I turn a viral feature on and it gets my friends to adopt the product, and then if when my friends adopt the product, I'm less likely to churn away from the product, I'm more likely to stick with the product, then, uh, as my friends adopt, I'm more engaged. As I use the product more and I'm more engaged, I'm more likely to send notifications and invitations to my friend, which creates more peer adoption, more engagement, more peer adoption, et cetera. And this is obviously useful for marketing, and I can usually tell who the marketers are in the audience when I show this result, because they sort of lean forward a little bit when they hear it. But it's not just about marketing, because we're applying the exact same methods to spread HIV testing in South Africa. So we're using mobile technologies to have friends uh, encourage their friends to go take HIV tests, and we're designing incentive systems that maximize the diffusion of that behavior through the cell phone network in South Africa. In South Africa, cell phone penetration is close to, and in some regions, greater than 100%. So we feel like we can get a lot of good work done using these types of methods. So I'll leave you with one final result. We did an experiment on Facebook to try and understand susceptibility to peer influence as a function of what your relationship status is, single in a relationship, engaged, married, or it's complicated. And in fact, we did this using a randomized experiment, which I won't go into the details of. Um, so if you're single, you are more susceptible to influence than if you don't report your relationship status on Facebook. That's the holdout set. If you're in a relationship, you're even more susceptible to uh, peer influence than if you're single. If you're engaged, you're even more susceptible to peer influence than if you're in a relationship. And if you're married, you're not susceptible to peer influence <laughs> at all, apparently. Um, and if it's complicated, you're the most susceptible to peer influence. Uh, and we debate what's going on in these results, like why is it the case? And there are lots of different explanations for this rise and then sudden drop off after, after marriage. And uh, if you want to uh, uh, talk to me about any of those results, I encourage you to come talk to me during the event or in, at the drinks afterwards. But more importantly, I encourage you to tell your friends to come talk to me. <laughs> Thank you.